Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. You know, I've been doing this, this program, the Watchman video broadcast, since about January of 2009. It actually came as a result, and I've shared this testimony before, with about three days spent in my office fasting and praying about direction. Direction for my life, direction for my ministry. I was even telling God, if you want me out of the ministry, just say so. Uh, direction for our church, or should our church take a new direction with a new pastor or whatever? I mean, I, I had everything laid out before God. And God uh, transitioned me and our church from a ministry. We had a Christian school. We had a daycare at the time. We closed both of those down, actually, before I knew what God was going to do after that. And a lot of times, that's how it works, folks. God will show us the next step, or He'll tell us what the next step is not knowing exactly what's going to happen after that. If you go, remember, go to Acts chapter 8 and look at Philip. God just simply told Philip, rise up and go. And, and God led him all the way to meet that eunuch from Ethiopia there in that chariot. But Philip really didn't have an idea. And when we transitioned our church and the things that we were doing at that time, I didn't have any idea of where God was going to take me or the church or anything like that. But you just do what God tells you to do and He tells you the next step. Well, the next step for me was something that I had the idea of. It came to me just like that and I knew it was from the Lord. Something that dealt with the things that are going on right now in our world. Politics, technology, the church especially. What's going on in churches all over this world. And called it the Watchman Video Broadcast. Now, it hadn't been too long before that that God really introduced me to the idea of what a watchman is. And I thought I would just do a, a simple teaching, maybe for some pastors out there, maybe for some church leaders out there, deacons, or just church members, or just concerned Christians, that God calls into a ministry of being a watchman. And I'm going to explain to you from the Word of God both what that is, um, what God requires out of those whom he calls watchmen, and the idea that not everybody in the body of Christ, and let me just say this, not every pastor especially, has been called into a watchman-type ministry. But I remember in 1997, when God first approached me and, and just sort of led me to understand that he was going to teach me things of a Bible prophecy nature. I didn't know where it was going, didn't know what I was going to be doing, but here again, I just submitted to that and said, Lord, you show me where to start, and that's what I'll start doing. And God led me along the way. And it became apparent to me that the things that I was seeing, both in the Word of God and in the world, just sort of qualified as what the Bible would refer to as a, a watchman-type ministry. Someone, let me just kind of explain this, you probably have an idea already, a, a city with a wall built around the city and towers along that wall and men would climb up in those towers and they would stand and they would watch. They would look out over the horizon. They would look out the fields. They would look out over, over the open areas around the city. One person posted here, another person posted on the other side of the wall looking in all the directions. What are they looking for? They're looking for anybody coming from any direction, whether down the road or through the valley. And they're looking to find out, to determine, to discern whether that person or that group of people is a friend or a foe. You see, they had the responsibility of if they saw what they knew was the enemy approaching, they had the responsibility of alarming and warning everybody. After all, it could be their own wife and children behind them inside the city that they want to keep safe. And so God made me aware of that throughout all oh, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2003 and 4 and, and so on. And so by the time 2009 came around and I began the Watchman video broadcast, it really was the result of years of study, years of God preparing me for the job that he had given me. And I can look all the way back in my life and see from my childhood that I just had a curiosity about, curiosity about mysteries and, and things that were covered. I wanted to see what it was. I wanted, to un I wanted to know what secrets there were out there. I wanted to have mysteries explained and so on. 
And so I can see that God really has used pretty much my entire life to bring me to this. And even since January 2009, doing the first Watchman broadcast, I can say that I know a lot more now than what I did then, a lot more about the Word of God, a lot more of what's in the Word of God, a lot more about what's going on around us. And I have learned over the years to rely simply upon the Word of God. And so to anybody out there that you think maybe God is calling you into this kind of ministry, number one, I believe the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God knows who you are. God knows who you are. God knows how He made you. God knows your, your strengths, your weaknesses. And uh, I couldn't say that, well, I think this person here would be a good watchman or that person there. That's really not my call. It's God's call. Let me show you the first verse that I'm going to deal with in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17. God said, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Now, very simply and very quickly, I'm going to move through about, I don't know, 30 some odd verses of Scripture. And I'm just going to show you from the Bible how God calls, what He calls them to, some of the requirements and so on. And here, very quickly, I have made thee a watchman of the house of Israel. God is the one who laid the calling upon Ezekiel. Ezekiel didn't call himself, and I think that's very important to remember. Because I do believe there are some good people out there that are watching what's going on, both pastor, uh, uh, maybe deacon, maybe church leaders, or just common believers in the Word of God that have an interest in what's going on around them and maybe trying to sound the alarm. I, I believe that, but I also believe out there, especially on the internet, guys that are on the internet, you know, okay, YouTube, Facebook, they've got blogs, they've got this and that and the other, and they're spouting off, and I'm just going to be dead honest, some of the most insane ignorance that I think I've ever seen in my life, and they brag and boast about how they're trying to sound the alarm, and really all they're doing in some cases it's laughable, but the problem is people believe what some of these people say. And if, if you look back at this verse, I have made thee a watchman. God prepared Ezekiel, I believe, from before he was even born. We know, that in, as in the case of Jeremiah, that God had called Jeremiah. He said, before thee, when you were being formed in the womb, I knew thee. God knew Jeremiah from the womb, John the Baptist from the womb. And I believe God had prepared Ezekiel all his life for this particular calling. And he said, Ezekiel, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. He had a very specific calling. He had a very specific target audience, people that he was to warn. Ezekiel wasn't called to warn everybody in the world. He was called to warn the house of Israel. And God had a, had a very specific requirement on how he was to do this. He was to hear the word at God's mouth and give them warning from God. He was to be the spokesperson of God Himself. And I'm going to develop that idea as we move along because I see some things that people are doing on the internet that are putting things out there. They're not from God. There's no way in the world they're from God. You know how I know? The things that they say and the things that they teach actually contradict the Word of God. In the very next verse, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18, he said, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Now here again, God's giving some very specific instructions on how Ezekiel is to do this. He is to warn the wicked. He's to let them know. Now, if Ezekiel doesn't do that, God's going to still judge the wicked man. He's not getting off simply because the watchman didn't do his job. God's going to judge that wicked person. But his blood I'm going to require at your hands. Now I will say this to every pastor who would listen to this. You may not have been given a specific watchman type ministry where you're trying to reach out to maybe your own church or maybe even globally. But I can tell you this, if you're a pastor, you're a shepherd. And as a shepherd, your responsibility is to guard and protect those sheep. You're to protect that flock. You're to protect sheep from leaving the flock as best as you can. I know it's not possible in every case. But you're also to protect that flock from what's out here from getting inside there. Sadly to say, 
too many pastors are failing at their job. And that's not my judgment. That's coming from the Word of God. And pastors, we are held to a standard that if God calls us into the ministry and we fail to warn people in our congregation of what is written in the Word of God and the judgment of God that is coming their way for things that you know that they're doing that are wrong, and you fail to warn them, God's still going to judge them. But you, sir, have blood on your hands. God dealt with me about this all the way back in my days in Bible college. I had a, a young man that I, when I was in high school, I sat next to him in a class every morning, and before the class, we had 10 minutes every day to talk and chit-chat and so on. He saw the Jesus Loves You sticker that I had on my band letter jacket my senior year in high school. And that whole year in high school, I never said a word to him about Jesus, about being saved, about what he needed. And he was one of these, he was a doctor's kid. He had a little money, had a nice car. My first year into Bible college, my mom calls me and says, you remember so-and-so? And I said, yeah, I sit next to him every day in algebra. He was killed in a car wreck. And God smote my heart that day. Mike, you should have said something. And you never did. You talked about sports. You talked about break dancing. It's the 80s. You talked about everything. You told jokes. You talked about everything under the sun. You didn't warn him. And now he's gone. Now it's too late. Pastors, we've got blood on our hands if we fail to warn the wicked that God's judgment is coming. So God tells them. But he said, if you, if you sound the alarm and you give them the word at my mouth, I'm going to judge that person. If he hear you not, I'm going to judge him. But you have, you have saved yourself in his blood. I will not require at your hand. It is a great responsibility. Here's something that I thought was interesting. is God not only says this to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 3, but exactly 30 chapters later, he's saying it again. He's given a few, few more details in this chapter. And this really... Ezekiel 33 seems to be the, uh, the core of what a watchman is and what it is they're required to do and also how they're required to do it. And we're going to show you that from the Word of God. Ezekiel 33, verse 2, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people. Let me just stop right here. The children of thy people. Remember, God called Ezekiel to be a watchman to Israel. Ezekiel was an Israelite. God wasn't calling him out in some faraway place somewhere to watch over them. They were his own people. And I'll tell you, I've been to different places around the country. I go to Kenya. We've been there a few times. going to plan on going back. And I love the Kenyan people. But when I come back to America, I realize these are my people. And I love them. America's got some problems. We've got some serious problems. But these are my people, and I love them, and I would like to warn as many of them as possible. And you look at that verse. He says, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring, not if, when I bring a sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet. And I'm going to show you from the word of God what that trumpet is. I'm gonna, it's right here in the scriptures. He said, let me redo that. And I'm going to show you from the word of God what that trumpet is. It's very specific what it is that we are supposed to be doing. Verse 4 again, Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people not, be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. 
Look at verse 7. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. There's a double witness there. Verse 8, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So you see here the heart of God. You see here that uh, even in the book of Amos, God said, surely the Lord will do nothing, but he reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. God told, um, here we have the mighty angel coming down from heaven in Revelation chapter 10, who has the, the book in his hand open. I think that's the word of God. He gives it to John. He says, John, eat it. And John eats it. Tastes like honey. Think about that. It's sweet to the taste, all right? He eats that, and the angel says, you're going to prophesy again before many peoples, nations, and tongues. And is that true? Everywhere there's a Bible published, the book of Revelation's in it, and John is prophesying to people all over the world. And so God prepares these men, God calls these men, and God gives them the role and the responsibility of doing a specific thing. They're to warn the people that God has given them the watch over. They are to warn those people of when they see the sword coming. The sword in the Bible is usually uh, an illustration or a symbol of warfare or an enemy attack coming, or maybe the judgment of God. That's what the sword represents. And God said, when you see that sword coming, you're to take a trumpet and you're to blow the alarm. And if you blow the alarm and the people listen to the alarm and they say, we need to get ready, you save those people and those people will be saved. But he said, if you blow that trumpet and they don't give heed to the warning, then you've done what you're supposed to do, but I'm going to judge those people. But he said, son of man, listen to me. You understand the heart of God here. If you, if you study this out now on your own, you'll see that God has a heart and a concern for lost people. And I'm going to show you that towards the end of this presentation. God has a concern and a love for people who are lost, for people who are in sin, and God gets no pleasure from destroying them. But God is a just, judicial God. God is love, that's true, but God also has to follow His own laws. And when pre people break those commandments and they break those laws, there must of necessity be a punishment for breaking those laws. And God is the only one authorized because he's the supreme judge. He can judge whom he wants to judge, but it will be based upon their transgressions. God will long suffer. God will be kind. God will be patient. But everybody who's ever known God and studied the Bible knows that God has a line. And when those people cross that line, God says, this is it right here. I'm going to send the sword. And I'm going to sound the alarm. I'm going to warn people. And I know, I know guys. I know preachers. And I, I look up to these guys who will walk out in the middle of a busy street and begin to preach the Word of God right out there in front of everybody, like John the Baptist. I can't do that. I'm too afraid somebody's going to spit on me or something like that. I just, but it's, it's, not, it's not me. But I know some guys that can do that. And I thank God for that. And you know why? Maybe, maybe they're not going to lead everybody that hears them to the Lord. Not everybody that they preach to is going to get saved. Maybe one every now and then. But you know what? God is not going to lead this wicked generation without a witness and a testimony of those who were bold enough to go out and say, this is thus saith the Lord. You need to hear what God says. And it takes a certain kind of man. Some of these guys are pretty rough and pretty abrasive. And that kind of turns some people off. But you know what? John the Baptist was that way too. He wasn't one of these suave, nice guys that put hand lotion on his hands all the time and said, now we're just going to learn about the love of God today. That wasn't John the Baptist. And that's not some of these street preachers out there either. God is going to leave this world. He's going to judge them, but he's going to send a testimony to them first. And it takes watchmen to watch, to see the sword coming for one purpose only. That is to save the lost man from being judged by God. Now, I'm not against putting out stories on the internet or talking about corruption in politics. I do that. 
I'm not against uh, talking about what certain corporations are putting into their products that's bad and, and medical issues that people like to talk. I'm not, I'm not against that whatsoever. I think, I think a, a transparency of the people who are looking at what big mega corporations are doing and big political machines are doing and things like that. I think one of the greatest tools in the world is the internet for getting information out there to warn people about things that are bad. I'm not against that at all. But when God calls a watchman, he's not necessarily worried about the politics. He's not necessarily worried about what's in the food. Sometimes he is, but not necessarily. God's main interest is in warning a lost man that he's about to be judged and does he want to take the opportunity to be saved and be forgiven of his transgressions. That's God's calling of a watchman is to warn them that judgment is coming. Now there's many ways to do that, but the basis of that is actually symbolized right here in Ezekiel chapter 33. I mean, stop and think about it. This is back before the days of, I don't know, text alerts on your phone. It's back before the days of newspapers. It's back before the days of uh, the internet or, or sirens like we have in the Midwest. And we have tornado sirens that sound the alarm when an approaching storm is coming. It's back before those days. A man up on that wall needed to be heard. He needed to be heard day or night. He needed to know that everybody in the city would hear a certain sound. And what better sound to give than the sound of a great big old loud trumpet, something with a small end on one end and a big flared end on the other. And if you, if you know anything about musical instruments, trumpets, trombones, euphoniums, tubas. I was a tuba player. Pretty good, I might say. But anyway, they all have this big flared in. Why? Because the sound starts out small, and as it goes through the tubes, it gets bigger and bigger, and what comes out is this massive sound, high-pitched, shrill sound, like a, like a siren on an ambulance or a fire truck or a police car, some sort of emergency vehicle. Those men had a trumpet on the, on the ready, and when they saw the sword coming, they were to sound the alarm. They were to blow the trumpet. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're called to be a watchman, you have to learn how to play a trumpet. I'm going to show you from the Bible what that means. What is it in today's world, what does it mean to sound the alarm and blow the trumpet? Let's follow the scriptures, all right? Numbers chapter 10, verse 2. Make thee two trumpets of silver of a whole piece. Shalt thou make them that thou mayest use them? for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. God told him to make two silver trumpets. And this is for the whole congregation of Israel in the wilderness. They would blow a trumpet. It's for calling the assembly. Everybody in the camp was going to hear this trumpet sound. Think of battlefields. Think of old battlefields and civil war and revolutionary war. And there was some guy out there blowing a trumpet. Not playing a flute or a piccolo, not against those instruments, or playing a guitar, but he's blowing a trumpet. Why? Because its sound was going to carry and everybody was going to hear it. That's the practical side of it. What's the symbolic side of it? Notice that God said, make them out of silver. Here's what's interesting. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver, tried in a furnace of earth, Purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now there's, a, now there's a connection here. God said make two trumpets and make them out of silver. Why silver? Because silver is a symbol for the purified word of God. And this is very important. I want you to get this. Anybody, anybody who watches this, who believes that maybe they have a watchman calling on them, what I'm going to tell you is this. You better make sure that when you warn people, you're telling them the truth. And the only real truth in this world is the seven times purified Word of God that's purified and been kept and preserved from that generation forever. And I'm going to show you from the Bible what happens when you sound an alarm with something that is not the purified Word of God. And here's what I'm telling you. 
and I'm going to reiterate this as this goes on. You call yourself a watchman. You're trying to warn people. But the stuff that you're putting online, the, the articles that you repost on Facebook or the YouTube videos that you send out to everywhere, you have no idea whether those things are really true or not. Oh, you might believe them. You might say, well, I believe that more than I believe uh, of, of the, the, the media news like CNN and Fox and things like that. Oh, yeah, you might believe it more. That doesn't make it true. And I've seen things come across my desk. I've seen emails come to my account. I've seen Facebook postings people, want, people wanted me to be aware of. And I'm telling you, they were outright lies. People warning about the comet Ison and people warning, you remember Y2K, don't you? Everybody's warning about Y2K, why it's going to shut down the whole world, bring in the great tribulation. I think the rapture is going to happen. Y2K. And you spread that around and you're a liar. Nothing happened. Comet Ison came around. Nothing happened. All of these other things that people were, I remember when I first started doing the Watchmen, there was a couple that made a YouTube video. They're sitting at a table kind of like this in their kitchen and they said, we're just trying to warn everybody. We heard from a friend of ours who knows a guy who was walking by a hotel meeting room where there was FEMA guys in there and they were talking about declaring martial law somewhere around uh, September or October of this year. That was 2009. And people were sending me, Pastor, have you seen this? Oh my goodness, I mean, this could, could this be true? They lied through their teeth and you posted it. You know what that makes you? A liar. You remember I had to learn this poem when I was in seventh grade. A boy implored to guard the sheep, despised his work, he liked to sleep. And when a lamb was lost, he'd shout, wolf, wolf, the wolves were all about. The neighbors searched from noon to nine, but of the beast there was no sign. Yet wolf, he cried next morning when the neighbors came out again. One evening about six o'clock, a real wolf fell upon the flock. Wolf, yelled the boy, a wolf indeed, but no one paid him any heed. Though he, screamed to wake the, though he screamed to wake the dead, he's fooled us every time, they said, and let the hungry wolf enjoy his feast of mutton, lamb, and boy. The moral's this, the man who's wise will not defend himself with lies. Liars are not believed, forsooth, even when liars tell the truth. And there are some people out there that mistakenly post things, I understand that, but there's some people out there who are repeat offenders. And the truth of it is, I love you. I don't believe a word you say anymore because you just keep sending out one false thing after, and you're blaming the government for putting out false stuff. And so are you. We're not called to just alarm everybody on what could be some big thing that, because people after a while, you, t you tell them about all these things that never happened. You know, like the London Olympics where you know, hundreds of thousands of people were supposed to die. And it was all based upon a game card. And nothing happened. And you warned people about that. And you warned people about comets. And you warned people about martial law. And you warned people about this. You warned people about, I don't know, 20, 30 events. And it never happened. And then you try to tell them, now listen, you need Jesus in your heart because you're going to die and go to hell. And everybody that you sent stuff to, they don't believe a word you say. We're not called to just give our opinions. We're not called to just tell everybody what we think might or could happen because God knows after a while they're not going to listen to you. You've lied too many times and they just say that's, that's his conspiracy theories or her conspiracy theories and I'm just sick of hearing that stuff. You've ruined your testimony of what you've done. God called you to sound the alarm. A trumpet, the Word of God, the purified Word of God, the preserved Word of God, the final authority of all truth anywhere. And you refuse to do it. Joshua chapter 6, verse 4, look at this. Seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. See, I like this. I like this. I just kind of happened upon this, this connection here not too long ago. Revelation chapter 5, notice this. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having what? 
seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. The seven trumpets, the seven horns of the Lamb, the seven spirits of God are the seven times purified word of God. They all connect. They all match up. Let me give you another one. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. You're going to be convinced, hopefully, on this one. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a, look at there, a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and Thyatira, and Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Did you see that? God had told Ezekiel, Son of Man, I've called thee to be a watchman. Here in the New Testament, now, now we have the real Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And when Jesus speaks, what does his voice sound like? Do you know what we're supposed to be alarming people with? The Word of God. Bible verses. I hear sermons a lot. Preachers preaching. What Some people would say, oh, that's good sermon. That's good preaching. No Bible verses in it. 40, 45, 50, sometimes an hour long. No Bible verses. They're not sounding the trumpet. They're not sounding the Word of God. They're giving their opinions. They're giving their stories. They're giving their experiences. They're giving you their own ideas, but they're not giving you the Word of God. I see, I, yeah, I believe in a high standard. I believe God's men are to be sounding the alarm of the Word of God. And if God calls you, whether you're a preacher, church elder, church deacon, or just a layman, or just somebody who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are required by God, if that's your calling and you believe it is, God doesn't call watchmen and then tell them, now don't blow the trumpet. Give everybody your own ideas. God doesn't do that. He told you, use the trumpet. Use the trumpet of silver, the word of God. The voice of Jesus himself is what you're supposed to, you know what, you, you know what I'm saying, don't you? Give them Bible verses. Give them preserved word Bible verses. You know me. I've got King James onlyism, don't I? I've, I believe that my Bible is pure, that it's undefiled, that it's incorruptible, and that it is silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. I believe this Bible is right 100% of the time. Now I'm going to show you something from 1 Corinthians 14. If you remember, 1 Corinthians 14 was all about the, um, if, you know, the talking in tongues and how they couldn't be understood. And see, here's what happens. You give people the Word of God. Did you know that the Word of God actually is alive and it has power? And if you give people the Word of God, you give them verses of Scripture, you give them passages out of the Bible, you don't have to worry about what God's going to do with it after that because that book is powerful. God will do whatever God wants to do with it. But whenever you give something like some of these off-the-wall Bible translations, or you're giving, them, you're giving them some man's ideologies, or you're giving some guy's theories on things. You know what that is? It's a trumpet with an uncertain sound. 1 Corinthians 14, 7, And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. He's talking about sounding a trumpet, and that trumpet having a very distinct sound. A trumpet that is recognizable, a trumpet that is known. Now I mentioned to you this little video of this couple sitting at their table. And I'm not, I'm not really, I don't remember all the specific details, but I remember that their story went something like, we know a guy who has a friend who walked by a meeting room where there were FEMA agents in it. I'm done. I'm done. I don't, I don't need to listen to any more of that. You're talking about people who've heard it from this guy, who heard it from this guy, who wasn't in the room, he simply heard it coming out of the room. I don't believe that for a second. You know what's sad? 
Some people I know did. They were scared. They were worried martial law was going to come that year. It was 2009. No, no martial law. None. Zero. I'm making this. A lot of people are talking about Jade Helm. To be honest with you, I have no idea what's going on with Jade Helm. There are some people that I know that are watching things right now and kind of keeping their eye out on things. But people ask me, Pastor, what do you think about Jade Helm? Because I heard that one guy said that Jade meant this and Helm meant this and that, that there was tunnels under Walmarts and think. I have no idea if that's true or not. Do you think I'm going to warn people about tunnels underneath these Walmarts that are being closed when I have no real evidence that that is even true? You know what that is? That's a trumpet with an uncertain sound. People won't believe it, number one. And then I come back with something from the Word of God. They'll say, yeah, you're the, you're the tunnels under Walmart guy. I've just ruined my reputation, and I just, I just don't think that's right, people. I'm just sharing my heart with you. I, when, God, when I really perceived that God had given me a watchman-type ministry, I wanted to learn what that was, and I realized that I needed to take it seriously. And if I just passed on everything that came to me under the sun, after a while, nobody would listen to me. One of the things I think is most important is if that watchman's on that wall, and I'm going to show you a verse here in a little bit. Um, if that watchman is on that wall, and he turns around and blows that trumpet, he should have a reputation that says, if he blew the alarm, we need to listen to it. He's never been wrong yet. That's the kind of integrity I would like to have. That's the kind of integrity that I think God desires out of his people that are watchmen. Isaiah 21, 6. The Bible says, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman. Let him declare what he seeth. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed. And he cried, A lion, my Lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. Behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. There's a couple things here that I want to point out. Number one, God calls the watchman. He is intended to be faithful. He says, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime. God calls us. This is not a part-time job. We're constantly looking. We're watching. Do we get our rest every now and then? Sure we do. I am set in my ward whole nights. In other words, I lay down, take it. I go get my rest. But as soon as morning comes, I'm back up there and I'm watching what's going on. What is he looking for? What is it that he's supposed to do? He said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Again, there are so many side items that we could be talking about. What Monsanto is doing, and I talk about that. What, uh, what the uh, Barack Obama is saying, what Rick Warren is doing, and so on and so on. And I understand all of that. Some of this stuff, I just, I don't know, I don't think it's all that big a deal. But my main concern, my main ministry, is to understand who or what Babylon is, what she does, how she works, what she's capable of, and to let everybody know that she's fallen and she's going to go down. And if you're in there with her, you're going to go down with her. That's the watchman seeing the sword come. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. You know what you're doing? I could say this. You want a watchman ministry? Ask God to give you a watchman ministry and warn Catholics that they're going to hell for falling down before idols. That'd be a good one. Probably wouldn't get you a lot of hits on YouTube, but that would be a good one because we're to warn people that Babylon is going down and Babylon is, at, number one, it's a religious idea that has work salvation attached to it and usually there's a graven image. I think it's the spirit of Babylon that's bringing everybody along with the false prophet to build that image of the beast. Isaiah 52, 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. 
when the Lord shall bring again Zion. You know what I think is wonderful? You know what I think God blesses? Is that, and I get a lot of this. I'll study the scriptures, I'll put something together, I'll talk about it, Pastor Mike, online, or I'll preach on it, or I'll talk about it in Watchmen. And I've just recently, I've had several emails from people saying, Pastor, you did it again. I'm studying something from the Word of God. I'm seeing something very specific. I see it going on in this world. I don't know how to tell people. And lo and behold, there you are making a Watchman video on the very thing that we were looking at in the Word of God. I like that kind of stuff because you know what that means? We're seeing eye to eye. Now, it's not possible for every pastor and every Christian in the world, Bible believers, to agree on every single thing in the Bible. Not possible. We all see through a glass darkly. God gives one this ministry. God gives one that ministry. And I know guys that if I love them and I appreciate their ministry and appreciate their stand, but I'm pretty sure if we sat together and started talking, we'd probably be going, I don't believe in that. I don't, I don't go along with that. That's not really my business. I like it when God's men see eye to eye on things. And I think good watchmen, good watchmen, God's watchmen, need to understand that they're not the only one out there that's sounding a specific alarm, that God has other people doing things for other people or in other areas. But we all use our voice together to sound the alarm. In other words, think about this. This guy, this guy here on the northwest corner sees the sword coming, he sounds the alarm. People aren't sure what to do until they hear the guy on the southeast corner blowing the alarm and they're going there's two wit there's two guys telling us we need to prepare for battle and that's what i see here i understand that you're not the only one I, there's a guy on youtube he says he hates my guts he says there are no preachers anywhere preaching the truth i'm the only one well, number one that violates the word of god God said that he would raise up pastors, many of them. And just because you think you got it all, that doesn't mean everybody else is wrong. And even if they, you disagree with them on something, that doesn't mean that God cannot use them and has not called them. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. I believe that's a reference to the old King James Bible for us. Where is the good way and walk therein? And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Now, Number one, I want you to think about this, okay? God's, God's telling, he said, I'm going to set watchmen over there and they're going to sound the trumpet and everybody's going to go, we don't care. We don't believe you. That's going to happen. There are pastors, people out there who've decided they're going to preach the old time way. They're going to seek out the old paths and they're going to tell everybody to walk in those old paths. Did you know they don't pastor mega churches and they never will? They'll have 30, 40, 50, 60, maybe 70 people come to their church, maybe 100 if God sends revival and souls are saved. But the truth of it is, most people don't want to hear the old time way anymore. And you know what I'm going to tell you, preacher? Keep preaching it. Keep preaching it. We need you out there. God needs you out there. Why? He never promised you when he called you to the ministry, he's going to give you a big church. He never said that. He did say, I'm going to give you my words. Will you preach it? You agreed. And God knew you. God knew you. God knew the heartache. God knew the pain, the suffering. God knew that you was going to be run out of that one church for it. God will give you another one. God will give you a blessing. So that's something to keep in mind. Just because people aren't listening doesn't mean we don't need to, or that we need to stop saying it. Keep doing it. Even if you don't get all the hits on YouTube that you think you ought to get, even if you don't have a big crowd, a big audience following you, keep saying it. God told you to say it. You go out there and say it. Now, something else about this. If you are warning people 
with the Word of God. And I don't mean just saying, no, the Bible says kind of like this, and I, the Bible tells us about, I mean give them scriptures, verse by verse, word for word. Give them the Word of God. Let the Word of God do what the Word of God does. It's alive. It's powerful. It's, it's quick. It'll bring dead people back to life. Let the Word of God do what the Word of God does. But if you fill your mouth and your YouTube post and your Facebook post and, and your blog with all other kind of nonsense and stories and make-believe stuff about you know a guy that knew a guy that snuck into the Bilderberg meeting and you know what he said? He said, quit doing that. Quit it. Get back to the Word of God. Because if you tell people a bunch of fantasy nonsense that really... It's not even true. You're not warning them of anything that's ever going to happen. And you failed as a watchman. Give them the Word of God. 2 Samuel chapter 18. Here's an example. I think of some of the specific things that I think are required of a watchman on the wall. And there's just a couple little subtle things here that I, 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 when I saw it, I went, wait a minute. I think I see this. 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 24. David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up, I want you to notice this, went up to the roof over the gate unto the wall. Think about where positionally they are. And lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king, and the king said, If he be alone, there's tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near. And the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, Me thinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man, and cometh with good tidings. Say, Pastor, what are you getting out of this verse? I mean, you've got these things underlined, but I'm not sure what you're getting at. Number one. There's two lessons, I think, taught here. Number one, position. And I'm going to show you what that means in a little bit. Another thing that I see here is recognition. And I'm going to cover that maybe today, maybe on another Watchman, all right? But let's deal with the first thing of position first. Notice that in this verse, 2 Samuel chapter 18, David sat between the two gates, and the Watchman went up to the roof over the gate unto the wall, and he lifted up his eyes. Where is he? He's high. He's up. What does that matter? 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 20. Here's, a, here's another verse that gives us a second witness on this recognition thing, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving, look at what he said, The driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. Now, I'll kind of talk about the recognition thing here in a little bit, but you kind of get this one, don't you? The idea that he's seen this guy's driving before. <laughs> yeah, what, what's he doing? Crazy stuff. He's driving furiously. I know who that is. I know who's driving that is. And it's, you know, some people are just recognized by their driving, all right? But he was able to recognize that. Now, going back to this verse here, 2 Samuel 18, he went up to the roof, over the gate, unto the wall. That means that he was set in a very high position. What good does that do? I want you to think about this for a minute. I'm going to put a graphic up here of two views of Times Square, New York. You ever been to Times Square? I was there back in the 80s. Back, it was dirty back then, all right? I've understood that they've cleaned it up a lot and so on. It's still New York City, but it just looks a little nicer now. Here's two views of Times Square, New York. The one on the upper left is sort of a man's eye view of Times Square. You see that famous big sign there and the two streets that kind of come together there. That's Times Square. New York. Now, if you were to just, if you were the one standing here taking this picture, oh, I'm sure you could see maybe, I don't know, four or five cars. You can make out four or five cars. You can probably actually see and just kind of take a guess. Maybe there's, I don't know, 50 or 60 people in this view here. 
But let's say about, I don't know, 10 blocks down the way, there were armored military cars headed down that way from, I don't know, China or Russia. Think of like, uh, I don't know, like Red Dawn, like they landed from the sky and now they're running down the streets of New York and they're going to take over the country. Can you see that from where you're standing there at Times Square? No. You wouldn't be able to see it until maybe it got maybe a block or two away and then you're going, oh. by then, it really almost is too late to warn anybody, isn't it? Okay? Kind of like, World War Z, I don't know if you've ever seen it, I don't recommend it. But anyway, they developed this zombie theory that once people are bitten by the zombies, they've got like, I don't know, 45 seconds, and then they turn into zombies right then and there. It doesn't take days and weeks. It's like 45 seconds. You don't really have time to warn everybody. You're seeing people turn into zombies right in front of you. You can't warn everybody because you're too close to where the danger is. So what remedy is that? If the city of New York wanted to put down crime, they're going to put cameras so they can catch people committing crimes. If they decided to put them down right on the street and on the sidewalk, they'd have to put cameras like every 10 feet and 10 feet grid squares. People would be tripping over cameras everywhere because they wouldn't be able to see anything. You've got to look at that second picture on the lower right. You've got to get way up high. The United States decided to start spying on other nations, and they figured out the best way in the world to do that was from like 35 miles up in space with a satellite that just hovers right over Moscow and Beijing and the Ukraine and Israel and all these, Iraq and Afghanistan. Why? because they got cameras that can look down from on high and see just about everything that goes on. Now we're pretty sure they can do it in real time. You see, the higher they got, the better view they could get. Now I want you to think about that idea and think about, oh, I don't know, who is really, if you were looking for a high position, who is the most high. Well, that's God. So here's what I'm getting at. Here's what I think I see here. The closer you are to God, the better you're going to be able to see. Because really, this whole watchman thing is about seeing the enemy come from a far enough distance away that you actually have time to sound the trumpet and warn people and give them enough time to prepare for the judgment or repent if that's what God is asking them to do. You're giving them enough time. I've been a minister for years and I'm telling you it's far better when you approach somebody that you care about and say you need to give your life to the Lord now because the sword is coming for you. God's judgment is coming. I don't know when but it's coming and they get saved and lo and behold sure enough 45 years later, they died. But you know what? They don't regret living for the Lord for those 45 years. Some people are hoping that you catch up with them on their deathbed. That's not very much time. And some people even miss it. You see what I'm saying? Giving a, posi a position of advantage, of being high, gives you the ability to warn people in enough advanced time to be ready and to know that when they die, God is going to judge them as being righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Follow me on this. Look at these verses. 2 Samuel 22. The Bible says, The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered His voice. We know who that is. That's God. Psalm 91.1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Psalm 107, 11, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of who? The Most High. Acts 16, 17, the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. 
in this county, Jefferson County, Missouri. I am pleased to see this. As a boy, I never saw it. And I remember some 20 some odd years ago, I saw, I stopped because I had never seen this before. There was a great big old hawk sitting right on top of a, of a utility pole, what we call telephone pole. That hawk, and I stood on the side of the road and just watched this thing. That hawk sits up there and you know what he's doing? He's watching. You know, God gave that hawk the ability to discern and see things hundreds of yards away. I don't know how far a hawk or an eagle can see, but there's that hawk looking. You know what he's doing? He's watching for a blade of grass to move. From way up there, that's what that hawk is doing. If he's down on the ground, he wouldn't be able to see it all, but he's up high and he's watching over these things. I saw, I saw, neatest thing I ever saw. I walked out the back door of our church one time and I just saw, 10 yards away from me, a hawk picking up a snake out of our church grass and flying away with it. And I just stood there and I went, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. You know how that hawk knew that snake was there? That hawk got himself on a perch way high and God gave him the eyes to see way down. And he looked and he saw a blade of grass twitch. And when he saw that blade of grass twitch, he knew what was down there, and he swooped down and he got that thing. Now you think about this. God is the most high God. There is nothing or anybody. Remember what Lucifer wants? He wants to be like the most high, doesn't he? He wants to be able to see everything. Here is God, and he is the most high, and he sees everything. And those of you, Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. And what I'm telling you is, this applies to pastors, husbands, fathers over families, anybody who has a responsibility over something. If you make the Lord, the Most High, your refuge, the closer you are to God, the better you're going to be able to see when the sword comes. That's why they put the watchman, not down on the ground. They put them up high, and there's nobody higher than God. Isaiah 14, 14, remember, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And think about it. Why does the serpent, the devil, want to be like the Most High? Where is he now? Genesis 3, 14, the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. You know what? There's nothing lower than a low-down snake. God made the serpent low down. He crawls around on his belly. But what does he want? He wants the power of God. He wants to be like the Most High. And I have a, talked about this on a Watchman video. Um, surveillance Society, the All-Seeing Eye, Surveillance Society in the New World Order. And I think the devil himself is part of what's setting up this camera grid all over the world to be able to see everything that's going on. Why? Because the low-down serpent who can't see anything wants to have the power of the Most High God to be able to see everything. Now there's another aspect of this of being high up and being able to see. Remember that picture of, of, in fact, let me go back to that, that picture of Times Square. You're standing there at Times Square, you're looking out. What is it that's blocking your view of whatever is coming? Let's say it's, let's say it's level ground. What is it that's blocking your view of something that's coming 10 blocks away? Buildings, trees. Statues, monuments, things are in the way. You can't see what's coming down this way. And by the way, the farther off it is, hear me on this one, the longer in time it's going to take for that to get there. Time is a very, very important part here. Because if you can see far enough away, you can give people enough time because you know it's going to take time. What you're saying is that I'm a watchman and I can see far enough that I know that in the future something's going to happen to this city. You know what that is? That's prophecy. 
And what I'm going to show you from the Bible is that the ability to see afar off is the ability that God gives us to see, even if it's in a limited way, into the future. Look at Genesis 22, 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now, let me stop right here. You know what place that was? Mount Moriah. You know what Mount Moriah is? It's where Golgotha, Calvary is, where Christ was crucified. You know what, Abra you know what Abraham was doing? He said, the Bible says it was on the third day. You know what it is? They traveled two days. And after two days, Abraham could see the place afar off. You know how far, you know how long away it was from when Abraham offered Isaac on the same place to when God offered his son? It was two days. Two thousand years. The day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Isn't that cool? And look at the language of the King James Bible. Abraham, on the third day, after two days, he lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. You know what that phrase, afar off, you know what I think it means here? But number one, realistically, Abraham was seeing Mount Moriah with his eyes. But number two, I think he was looking into the future at what God was going to do on Mount Moriah 2,000 years later. You say, well, I don't know about that. Look at Genesis 37, 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. You know what that is? That's Joseph's brothers who see Joseph coming from a long way away, and they see him coming, and they know they've got time to get together and conspire against him so that in the future time when he comes near to them, they're going to enact their conspiracy. Now, we're not the only ones in the world who think or know that Jesus is returning, are we? I believe that this, the God of this world, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, knows and believes that Christ is coming back in the future. And I think that there is a conspiracy that has been set up from ages past in preparation to destroy. Think about uh, Revelation chapter 12. Here's the woman giving birth. And there's the dragon standing right in front of her to devour her child as soon as it's born. He is waiting in anticipation of a future event that he knows is going to take place. And he has positioned himself before the event takes place to be able to do exactly that. So what am I saying? I'm... 100% sure that if you want to understand conspiracies, conspiracy theories, who's really involved, what's really going on in this world, there is no better source than for you to get where the Most High God is. And that's this right here. You place yourself with the Most High God and God will let you see things afar off things that are coming in the future. I can warn people about their death. I can warn people about the second coming of Christ. I can warn people about those things because I absolutely know beyond any doubt in my mind that death is coming to people and I'm warning them of a future event afar off that I know according to the Word of God is going to happen to them. You see what I'm getting at here? There's a conspiracy going. It's been talked about in ages past. And God, if we read our Bibles, God will help us see it. One of those is, I will ascend into heaven and I exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will, send, um, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That Lucifer said that. Who knows when he said that? But it's recorded in the Bible. When is it going to happen? It's going to happen in the future. I want to tell everybody I know that I know for a fact that that's going to happen. Don't know exactly when, but it's coming, and I'm going to sound the alarm and have everybody prepared so that they're not deceived on that day. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 7. Look at this. The, the, the rapture of Elijah. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 7. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. You see that? Here we have 50 of the sons of the prophets. You know what they're viewing afar off? The day when God's first people, Elijah, are taken into heaven, and God's second people, Israel, 
go back and God gives them a double portion of the Holy Spirit. Wow. You know what? You believe the Bible and you read this book and you see those things, you can see those things coming afar off. You're one of those 50 sons of the prophets that can see those things coming afar off. And how can you do that? You're drawing near to the Most High God. He gives you the ability. He lifts you up and He gives you the ability to see things that nobody else can see. You know why? They're too far down here. They're too close to the world to be able to see it. Mm, 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 mm. Jeremiah 46, 27. But fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar off and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and be at, in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. God said he was going to save thee from afar off. Look at that. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He says it right here. The language of the King James Bible tells you that the idea of afar off, not just seeing um, distance-wise, seeing into the future. Peter knew exactly what was going on. Now I'm going to show you these Two verses here, I'm going to bring this to a close on this part of it today. The ministry of a watchman, being able to see into the future. Notice Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. And these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them, how? Afar off. They see it in the future. Remember, remember what Abraham saw? And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were all looking for a country, weren't they? but not the one on the earth. They were seeing into the future when God was going to fulfill His word perfectly and the country that they sought was down the road as far as time is concerned. And there's that phrase afar off and there's one more here, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 8. Study this out. I like this one. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. I'm going to say this in closing today, and we have, I have a lot more to give, be a two-part of this thing, understanding the role in the ministry of a watchman. There are people out there on the Internet. The Internet is basically the marketplace of ideas, and I'm not opposed. Everybody just pitching their ideas in and see what happens, all right? But there's people out there who are saying that God sent them and they have a, you know, they're the watchmen and they're trying to warn everybody this and that and the other. You know what I'm looking for? Bible verses. You see, because if I don't see scriptures, if I don't see the Word of God in their videos or, or in their books or on their blog or on their Facebook posts, if I don't see the Word of God there, do you know what I think? I think maybe they're not dwelling with the Most High God. And if they're not up there with the Most High, I don't think they see what they think they see. Because when you're living down low, like a serpent does, you don't see things for how they really are. And you don't warn of the things that really are approaching. You're just guessing. You're just spreading internet rumors around. You're just sending this is one of my favorite hated words, false flags. You're the one accusing the government of using false flags all the time, but isn't that what you're doing? And by the way, some of those guys, they're making pretty good money because you saw something on Facebook and you click the link and you go to their website and you saw this little bitty story surrounded by 20 blinking advertisements. You know why they put that stuff out on the internet? Because they knew that there was a sucker out there that would click it and go to their website and they just got paid for it. That's a different kind of watchman. That's not the ones that care about your soul, is it? And their lack of scripture or their lack of use of scripture or proper use of scripture, or you can tell they're not dwelling with the Most High God. And if they're not up there with God, close to the Most High, I don't trust what they see. I don't think they see anything. And I'm not too worried about what they have to say. 
but whether it's me or any of these, there's people out there that are sounding the alarm of the Word of God. And if they are, you're well advised to heed what it is that they have to say because they see something coming down the road. And maybe you've got time. And that's another aspect we'll visit here in the next part of this. Maybe you've, and you've got time now to prepare for the warning that you receive. And I would say to anybody watching this, you've heard me talk a lot of times, about seven or eight times a week. I'm trying to, trying to say what I think God would have me say from the Word of God. If you take any of that and apply it to your life, and God saves you between here and the time He brings down His judgment upon this earth, I'd be pretty happy about that to know that God used something that I said from the Word of God to save a man from the judgment that's coming afar off. When we get to the end of this, of this teaching, you're really going to see the heart of Almighty God in this thing. So we'll get into that the next time on the next, uh, next portion of this. We'll look at some more responsibilities of the watchman on the wall. Study this issue out yourself until the next time we bring this forward. All right. Hey, God bless you. It's good to be with you. This is Pastor Mike, the Watchman Studios, saying God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.